Welcome everyone. We'd like to welcome all of our viewers and listeners to another Vasculitis Foundation webinar. I'm Kathy Olewski, the Vasculitis Foundation's educational video series host. And I'm also a patient living with vasculitis. I was diagnosed with MPA vasculitis in 2008 and I was in treatment for six years and I'm happy to say I've been in remission off treatment for eight years. Today's topic for our webinar is vasculitis and skin. And we have an excellent um, guest with us today that is going to help us understand everything. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Galen Folk, who is an assistant professor of dermatology at the University of North Carolina. He's also the co-director of the UNC Rheumatology Dermatology Integrated Clinic and the UNC Multidisciplinary Vasculitis Clinic. Well, that was a lot to say at one moment, but well, welcome Dr. Falk. We're so happy to have you here. This topic today is just, it's all over our social media groups. It's such a big concern for vasculitis patients and, and I'm so happy to have you here and I'm gonna, if it's okay, say welcome and turn things over to you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'm so excited to be here. Um, vasculitis is a, a complicated topic that touches on a lot of lives and uh, it touches on the skin very often. You know, the skin uh, is a big part of our identity. It's a big part of who we are. It's a big part of how we interface with who we are in the rest of the world. So when a condition impacts our skin, it's, uh, it's always on patients' minds. It's important to doctors to be able to address it. And I'm very excited to talk today in uh, some level about the ways that this disease can impact our body's biggest organ, the skin. I'm going to get my screen shared here. And we'll get to it. Everything coming through okay, Kathy? Yes, we see it. We're, we're, we're anxious and ready. All right. Thank you. And thank you again for that kind introduction. I have the great privilege of working at UNC with some giants in the world of vasculitis. I'm very excited to work uh, alongside them to diagnose and care for our patients. Uh, it's been a, a truly wonderful experience. So we're going to talk about how vasculitis impacts the skin. Uh, we in academic medicine, we always have these disclosures. I don't own any financial interest in anything that impacts my decision making or anything like that. Uh, but I do want to disclose that there are photographs of actual patients in here, and some of the photos can be quite intense. My goal is to help people understand the way vasculitis impacts the skin. My goal is not to make anyone relive what can be very traumatic memories for our patients that have um, these conditions. So if, if, if you're someone who might be impacted by seeing these images or it might bring up some tough memories for you, you know, maybe it's best to just listen uh, and, and tune in. But I'll do my best to point out the photos that I think might be most distressing. But I'm a dermatologist. I see this all day, every day. So I get a little desensitized to the impact some of these photos can have. So I just want to put that disclaimer here and I'll make some disclaimers in front of some of the most intense photos. But you know, our goal is to educate and not upset anyone. So our goal today is to talk about vasculitis from a skin perspective. We'll review what we see on the skin from vasculitis. And I'm going to go through a lot of kind of nitty gritty anatomical details because they can really help us understand what we're seeing. My goal is to help us connect what's going on microscopically to what we're seeing on a patient's skin. I'll talk about a lot of the ways we evaluate patients for vasculitis, um, but uh, you know, one question I get a lot is what's the skin biopsy for? How does it help us? So we're going to talk about when it's valuable and how we have to be careful in interpreting it. I like to frame all of my discussions in terms of cases because my best teachers have been my patients and uh, all of them, including in this talk, have volunteered to help teach other people and we're grateful for that. So a typical day in my clinic starts like this. A patient comes in with a rash, obviously. This particular patient uh, was a man, 54 years old, who not too long ago had had a bad upper respiratory infection. I'll use a lot of doctor acronyms, but I promise I will translate them from their Greek into, into real words. Uh, this, for, this acronym right here means past medical history. Uh, he was just, he had some high blood pressure, but other than that, he'd been a very healthy person. No medication changes for years. This acronym means review of systems. When your doctor asks you a lot of questions that seem unrelated to what's going on, they are performing what's called a review of systems. We did that for this patient and he's healthy otherwise. He doesn't have joint pains. He doesn't have fevers. He's got no cough. His urine hasn't been a funny color. And he's referred to me because the doctor that sent him to me wants to know, is this vasculitis? 
Well, as a dermatologist and as a dermatologist who's specifically interested in autoimmune diseases like vasculitis, it just takes a quick glance. I know this patient has a vasculitis. I've seen enough of it that you can recognize it, just like we've seen our mother or our father enough times that when we see their face, we can recognize it. We don't have to necessarily go through a stepwise process. A lot of skilled dermatologists can recognize vasculitis by looking at it. But how do I know that? How can I be sure that that's what's going on here? And what steps do I have to take to take care of this patient? That's kind of what we're going to talk about. To understand that, we need to understand the skin a little bit. And this is a picture. It's a rough schematic, of course, of the skin. Hopefully my mouse is showing up but we have the living top layer here, which is called the epidermis. This is the part of the skin that we can see, touch, and feel. Underneath the epidermis, the pale yellow here is called the dermis. It's non-living spongy tissue. And then we have this dark yellow on my um, picture here. This is called the paniculus. Sometimes this is called fat tissue. This is shock absorbing and temperature regulating tissue underneath our skin. And then we have other layers like muscle and fascia underneath that. Coming from the deep parts of our body, blood vessels penetrate up through the fascia, through the fat, and they branch in the dermis, uh, going from large trunks, looking very much like a tree, to medium-sized branches, to tiny little twigs at the end. And these tiny little twigs feed the skin and all the other important things that are in there that we can't see. Vasculitis is an autoimmune condition, you all probably know this, where the immune system damages the blood vessels directly. How it affects the skin can be in several different ways. Just like it can affect different organs, it can affect the skin. The skin is an organ, it's the largest organ in our body. It can affect our skin in very specific ways, ways that the vasculitis itself is injuring the skin. But patients with vasculitis can have nonspecific findings too. The specific findings relate to the size of the blood vessel that's being injured. And the size of the blood vessel that's being injured dictates not only what we see clinically, but what type of vasculitis the patient has and can help us understand what they're at risk for and what we have to take care of. Nonspecific findings are not from direct damage to the blood vessels, but patients with any autoimmune disease have an immune system that doesn't work quite the right way. And as such, any of the other inflammatory conditions of dermatology are a little more common. Vasculitis seems to have some um, more common entities, but we'll get into that later. Again, specific changes, maybe the most important point I can make is that the specific changes we see from vasculitis has to do with the size of the vessel that's impacted. So the categories that are broadly defined, and they're defined in something called the Chapel Hill Consensus Criteria, named for the town that UNC is in, are small vessel vasculitis, medium vessel vasculitis, and large vessel vasculitis. And each size vessel has kind of different findings. So the smallest vessels are those right up here at the top of the tree, the tiny little vessels that are much smaller than a human hair. When these vessels are impacted, we develop something called petechia, and I'll talk more about that in detail. When medium vessels are involved, the medium vessels are the larger vessels. Strictly speaking, it's the deeper trunk area, but we have kind of this small medium overlap area where the tree starts to branch. And uh, when involved down here, we'll see some different changes. I'll show you photos. And then large blood vessels, large arteries are not pictured in this. Large arteries are deep underneath the skin. Large vessels have names like the radial artery or the temporal artery, and they're deep down, so they're not in this picture. This patient has petechia. So what do we mean by that? Petechia um, or a physical finding. They don't specifically mean vasculitis. Everybody in these pictures here have petechia, but only one of them has vasculitis. The others are from other disorders like endocarditis here in the middle, Rocky Mountain spotted fever up here, and celiac disease. However, this patient has vasculitis. Petechia are a fancy word that we use in medicine to define something we see. They belong to a, a broader category called purpura. So we'll zoom out for a little bit. What's purpura? Purpura or is what happens when blood vessels get outside, excuse me, blood cells get outside of the blood vessels. So they go from inside the blood vessel, they get outside by any means, and they're trapped in the tissue and the dermis. It can happen from a bruise, from a fall. It can happen from vasculitis. It can happen when you have too few platelets. There's a lot of reasons for that to happen. 
but purpura doesn't blanch, meaning when you push on it, the color stays the same. So other rashes like psoriasis or eczema are red too, but when you push on them somewhat firmly, the skin will return to its normal color, and when you release, it will become red again slowly. The redness in those conditions is from extra blood flow in the area, and push it, but that blood is in the vessels. When you push on it, it gets pushed out. It turns pale skin color. Purpura is from any cause. Petechia are specifically very small purpura, one, two, three millimeters, somewhere in that range. We often describe small vessel vasculitis as palpable purpura, which is accurate, but we want to use that specific term petechia. Palpable means we can feel it when we run our fingers over it softly, so we can feel little bumps. So if you think about freckles, when you run your fingers over those, you don't feel them. You know, those are called, those are not palpable, but vasculitis is palpable. And that's from the immune system. The immune system, a special part of it called complement, is damaging the vessels, making them swell. The swelling is microscopic. We feel it as tiny little bumps. So when we have petechia that we can feel, that means the immune system's involved and it helps us understand we're probably looking at vasculitis. So petechia is from autoimmune injury to the blood vessels. The vessels burst as a result and petechia form. The immune injury from the vasculitis itself is what makes them palpable, it's what we can feel. In the small vessel vasculitis, specifically related to the case we're talking about, but maybe not to some of the cases later, it's caused by immune complexes. Immune complexes are antibodies. These are proteins that float around in our blood that are designed to destroy germs. In vasculitis, these antibodies either stick to each other or they stick to a particle in such large quantities, a particle that's maybe not supposed to be there, that they can no longer be dissolved in blood. It's kind of like, I live in the South, so we have this thing down here called sweet tea, where they pack tons and tons of sugar into tea. And oftentimes they put too much in and it's more sugar than the tea can dissolve and it drops down to the bottom. It looks like this. When you have too much sugar in the tea, it drops down to the bottom. The same thing happens with these immune complexes. They don't dissolve well. They fall, they become undissolved. And just like the sugar drifts to the bottom of the glass of tea, the immune complexes drift to the bottom parts of our body, which is why this patient and so many patients with small vessel vasculitis get petechia on their lower legs and ankles. They deposit at the very tiniest tip of the blood vessels, the blood vessels rupture and we get blood vessel or we get blood outside of the vessels and it injures the skin over top of it. So we get these spots coming at, up. We're looking at skin and cross section. So if we look at the surface of the skin, if we rotated this skin 90 degrees toward us and saw the top, we would see purplish red spots, just like this. So that's what we're looking at here from the surface. All right, so these are petechia. This condition gets a lot of names. These small vessel involvement, when we see a patient like this, we call this cutaneous small vessel vasculitis or leukocytoclastic vasculitis or cutaneous leukocytic angiitis. We have all these huge names for it. Small vessel vasculitis is the easiest thing to say. So it's from immune complexes. When I see this patient, what's important is I've got to find it. I'm finding vasculitis as a something I'm observing on the skin. It becomes my job to find out what it's from. And there's a lot of different causes of small vessel vasculitis. We'll touch on them in a moment. But right now we're going to say, I've got the finding. How do I figure out what's going on with the patient? Here's a little peek under the hood at what goes through your doctor's mind when he's evaluating vasculitis, specifically small vessel vasculitis. It changes depending on the type. For small vessel vasculitis, petechia that we can feel, we evaluate four things. The history, what is going on in the patient's health history? We do that review of systems I told you about. We ask a broad series of questions about different parts of the body to see what their health is. With small vessel vasculitis, we always need to evaluate the patient's urine because it gives a peek as to the health of the kidneys. And we're always gonna do a skin biopsy. Let's talk about these a little bit more. Why does my doctor want to biopsy my skin? I think that's a question that vasculitis patients have often. And they might be interested why specifically are we doing, we usually do two biopsies actually. Well, we do two different biopsies at the same time. One is called a 
standard biopsy or an H and E, that's a, again, a little bit of doctor lingo that refers to the way the biopsy is processed. That helps us confirm that this is vasculitis and just make sure that it's not one of the few things that can mimic it. Can also help us understand the accuracy of the second and kind of more important biopsy, which is called the DIF. The DIF evaluates for the presence of a very specific type of antibody. Our body has lots of different types of antibodies, but this biopsy evaluates for IgA. IgA's presence can help us understand a lot about the risks the patient faces. If we find IgA in the biopsy, it increases the chance that the patient might have kidney involvement of their small vessel vasculitis. When present, we need to watch carefully over time to make sure that that doesn't develop. If IgA is present, we're gonna very closely watch the patient's urine. And if it's absent, we feel really good about that. This is what we look at under the microscope. It's a really confusing jumble, but this right here and this right here used to be blood vessels. The immune system is damaging them. And that's what this shows. All this pink stuff in the background uh, is uh, collagen, that dermis that I showed you. These tiny little red things are red blood cells. And all these blue things that look like bees swarming around the blood vessels are called neutrophils, parts of the immune system. So this is that H and E biopsy, the standard type. And this is the DIF. The blood vessels are glowing in this study. And uh, a certain test for IgA uh, would make them glow uh, for that study. And if present, we do what we just talked about. We also ask the history. So the biopsy helps us know what we're doing. Um, the history can help us understand where this is coming from. If the patient has lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, the vasculitis is almost always from that. If the patient was recently diagnosed with lung cancer, that can be a common cause. Infections like a cold, medications, illegal drug use can all be good clues as to where it's coming from. The review of systems is helpful for us where we ask about all these different body systems. It can help us understand whether we need to do blood tests is really what it comes down to. So uh, like I said, the urine tests give an example of the kidney. So back to our patient, you know, he is a person who recently had a pretty significant cold. He didn't really have much in the way of a past medical history. His review of systems showed us that the rest of him felt really well. So as we said we'd do, we do a biopsy, which confirms he had vasculitis. We did the DIF, which shows that he does not have IgA. He has lots of other types of antibodies, but they don't really mean anything for this case. And his urine analysis is unremarkable, showing no risk for kidney involvement. So this patient had what we call hypersensitivity vasculitis. It's just from having a cold. Most vasculitis, if you take all of the vasculitis in the world, over half of them are just like this patient, patient that only had vasculitis in the skin and nowhere else. Most of these patients, we never figure out what caused it. It happens for no good reason. That word in medicine is idiopathic. There's a little bit of a joke that uh, doctors tell each other. It's not true. Sometimes we say idiopathic means we're too much of an idiot to figure it out, but that's not the case. Most of the time, uh, there is no cause. It happens just for purely bad luck. After that, the next most common type is hypersensitivity. It came from an infection or it came from a medication. Uh, less than 20% of patients with vasculitis have symptoms anywhere other than the skin. And less than 2% of patients like this would ever have any fatality from this. It's incredibly, incredibly rare to have any threat to your life from this type of vasculitis. Treatment is interesting. In a patient like this, they often ask, do I have to treat this doc? And the short answer is no. If they don't have much of a bother from it and there's no organ at risk, we don't have to treat it. We just treat to the symptoms. Most patients like this, the disease will just go away on its own in a few weeks. But if it lasts and lasts for a couple months, maybe we need to make sure that we have the right diagnosis as to what type of vasculitis they have. So if we decide to treat it, most of the time we can use things like just over-the-counter ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, and compression. Compression stockings can be very valuable for these patients. Uh, sometimes we use um, anti-itch medications like fexofenadine and over-the-counter antihistamine can be helpful and topical steroid creams just to control the symptoms. Uh, if the case is resistant and persistent, we can use medicines like prednisone or there are lots of medicines by mouth that we can use 
Dapsone and colchicine are examples of medicines that don't suppress the immune system, but if the disease persists, we can use true immunosuppressants with a careful discussion about the risks and benefits. And then there are more aggressive therapies as well. This patient just wanted compression and topicals, did great, a few months later, totally clear. This is a slightly different case. This is a patient with similar findings. We see some blisters on the skin, that happens, but we see these uh, blood colored spots that we can feel, palpable petechia. This man is a little bit younger. His review of systems is normal. He feels fine other than this rash. So carrying with our typical way forward, we do a biopsy and it confirms that we were right. It is vasculitis. And then we do that second biopsy, the DIF. And at this patient, it does show the presence of that antibody IgA. So we check his urine. And at first it's unremarkable. But because we saw the IgA, we know to check it very regularly going forward. And five weeks later, we find blood and protein in his urine. That's a sign that the vasculitis is irritating the kidneys. Small vessel vasculitis irritates the kidneys in a way that lets blood and protein through. So with we got help with our, uh, we partnered with our team in nephrology and we used a non-suppressive uh, medicine, a non-immunosuppressive medicine called Dapsone, which cleared the skin rapidly and protected the kidneys. Uh, even if patients have IgA, the majority of them are going to clear in a, in, in a few weeks to months. A small percentage, maybe about a fifth or a little less, will go on to have persistent disease of the skin or the kidneys, and we use the same sort of treatments here. This patient did really well in just a few weeks and uh, has been clear since. This is a slightly different picture. So this is a patient with vasculitis, but we don't see any blood colored spots here. In fact, we see what look like hives, or as the medical term would be, urticaria. Urticaria or hives are usually very, very itchy. They show up and a few hours later, they move to a different place. So a spot shows up, resolves, and a new one pops up somewhere else. This patient's urticaria show up they sting and they burn instead of itch. They hang around for a very, very long time. And as they start to fade, they leave a little bit of brown discoloration, which you can see in the middle of this fading one here. This is a red flag for a doctor familiar with vasculitis because there's an entity called urticarial vasculitis. We do a good history on this patient and we find out that she's an IV drug user, which you know our goal in medicine is not to uncover anything or tell on anybody, it's actually illegal for us to do. Our goal is only to help, so we need all that information. Uh, when we do a review of systems, we find out that she's had some fever, she's not feeling well, she's run down, she's very sleepy, she's got a lot of joint pain and some of her joints are quite swollen. So that's concerning. We do a biopsy and it doesn't show vasculitis. It's read as something called sweet syndrome. We did a DIF and it's negative, there's no IgA there. But we do a urine analysis because clinically, I'm very worried about vasculitis based on the symptoms. And we see that she's got some blood and protein in there. She has some kidney involvement. Now this is sweets disease. To a trained dermatologist, this is not sweets. Sweets looks very different. It's very edematous, meaning it's semi-translucent. It's got these dusky dots in the middle. I know that that doesn't fit. So I'm, I remain persistent that I think this patient has vasculitis. So I follow my pathway because she has blood and protein in her urine and her IgA was negative, we do a lot of blood work and we find that she has something called complement that is low. C3 is complement. We find out that she's positive for hepatitis B and the remainder of her workup is negative. We partner with nephrology. We start this patient on dapsone and prednisone and I re-biopsy it and it shows vasculitis the second time. So this case is instructive for a few reasons. Number one, urticarial vasculitis is a different type of vasculitis. It's still the same process that we were talking about. It just manifests in a somewhat strange way. Instead of the blood spots, we see what look like hives that last too long. They burn and sting instead of itch, and they leave some coloration behind. You'll also notice that we did a biopsy, and it didn't show vasculitis. That's not uncommon. I think a lot of people view a skin biopsy as kind of like back when we were in high school or college and we were doing like a math problem and we wanted to see if we were right. We'd flip to the back of the book and there was an answer section to show us if we got the right answer. Biopsy is not something that proves our answer in the skin. It's something that supports a suspicion that we already have. 
So it's not uncommon for a patient to have a biopsy that says vasculitis, but the doctor will tell the patient, actually, I don't think you have vasculitis and vice versa. It's not uncommon to have a biopsy that doesn't show vasculitis, but the doctor says, I think you have it anyway. The biopsy and what we see in the patient clinically have to match. So it's, it's a piece of evidence. It's not the, it's not the, the answer key. I hope that makes sense. There's different types of urticarial vasculitis. When complement is low, it usually means the patient is going to have lupus. Although a small percentage of the patients, it's associated with a virus like hepatitis in this patient. When the complement is normal with urticarial vasculitis, that's a really good thing. It means that there's very low risk of kidney involvement. It usually means it's hypersensitivity vasculitis, but urticarial vasculitis is pretty rare. Small vessel vasculitis can have a lot of other appearances. Again, this patient, uh, very, very young baby, looks a little bit more like urticaria. Um, this will be my first warning. The next couple photos can be a little bit striking. So if you think you're someone who might need to look away, this would be a good time to do it. Uh, oops, it's the next photo. But this patient has what's called a bywater lesion, a type of lesion that's common in rheumatoid vasculitis. This patient has what's called golfer's vasculitis. He gets vasculitis when he's active. Uh, and then here's our intense photos. So take a, take a break if you need to. This is called erythema elevatum diutinum, a special type of small vessel vasculitis that can really be quite striking looking. All right, the photos are gone. All right, back to the skin. Just as a way of review, small vessel vasculitis is autoimmune injury to the tiniest blood vessels the vessels burst and result in petechia most of the time. Although urticaria can happen, it's quite rare. Immune injury makes them palpable. We can feel them. With small vessel vasculitis, it can sometimes affect the kidneys. It's the smallest vessels. So when it does, it manifests as blood or protein in the urine. And that's why your doctors are checking the urine. All right. Let's change gears a little bit. Here's a patient that has petechia. They're a little bit larger, but notice they're on nodules. So they have these big, broad bases. The others were like two, three millimeters. You know, this is three quarters of a centimeter. It's very palpable. And instead of being tiny little spots, they're starting to get spiky. In dermatology, we call this stellate or star-shaped. We call it using our dermat imagination because this is not what stars really look like, but this spiky star shape can be a warning sign to your dermatologist. You can see these aren't on like the lowest parts of the body. They're kind of higher up, you know, arms, hands. See this patient has, this is arthritis. This is a large swollen ankle. It's really puffy. This patient uh, was 15 years old. And the history told us that for a few weeks, the patient has had fever and cough, which was being treated as an upper respiratory infection. For about three days, he's had this rash. And the morning that this photo was taken, he was really sleepy and his mother was having some trouble getting him woken up. She also noticed that his nose had been bleeding the night before. Prior to this, he'd been perfectly healthy, but that review of systems is really concerning. Fever, arthritis, very, very sleepy. That's what lethargic means. Nosebleed, cough. We did a biopsy. We did two of them. And we see that this is vasculitis. Now, we did a DIF here, that second type of biopsy, but it was negative. But I already kind of knew it was going to be. I'll tell you why. This patient's urine analysis did show blood and protein in it. So vasculitis is in fact affecting the kidneys. Because this patient is very sick, we do blood workup. We see that this patient has ANCAs, specifically PR3 positive. PR3 positivity and vasculitis on a biopsy are the features of a disease called granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or GPA. GPA is one of the ANCA-associated vasculitis, uh, vasculitides, and I think that, that these disorders are well represented in the Vasculitis Foundation membership. A third of these patients are going to have skin manifestations and they can have specific or nonspecific like we talked about. But the biopsies can be a little bit more challenging to interpret. We don't need to go deeply into the details, but these patients have a lot more nonspecific findings than some of their smallest vessel vasculitis uh, companions. So they can actually get sweets. They can get other findings like PNGD or pyoderma gangrenosum. We'll talk about those. Um, but this patient uh, had 
one of these key features. They had granulomas in their skin, which we see some of the areas around this deep pink here. Um, so these, this patient's findings is instructive based on the pathology. We talked about small vessels being up here resulting in petechia. Well, when vasculitis affects a little bit further down the tree, kind of in, the, in, the, in this gray area where the tree is branching, we can get these small to medium vessel findings. The deeper down you go, the more likely you are to get larger bumps. You can get star-shaped or spiky things, and I'll explain why in just a minute. And these are called medium vessel findings, small to or small medium to medium vessel findings. And ANCA-associated vasculitis can bridge the gap. Instead of the pathology just being at the top, it can be a little bit deeper. So when it gets deeper, there's a bigger area of the surface that's affected because we're knocking out all these little vessels downstream from it. And you can also get different layers of involvement kind of stacked up on each other right next to each other so that when we look at it from the top down and we rotate that skin and look at the surface of it, we can get these kind of star-shaped or spiky things. Or sometimes we'll even get these net-like changes where we have areas that are involved and then normal blood vessels in the middle making this kind of net or ring shapes. Sometimes they can even ulcerate because too many blood vessels are knocked out. So here's a patient with ANCA-associated vasculitis. We can start to see the spiky star shapes. We can start to see spiky star-shaped little areas of skin death or necrosis. They start to stack up on each other, making these large areas of purpura that are spiky or star-shaped. They can get erosions and ulcers that are spiky and star-shaped, or they can be really clustered and spiky and star-shaped. Some patients will just get these findings called levido, which are these pale pink to purple net-like appearances. As we can see on this patient, they kind of look net-like or ring-like. I wanna say thank you very much to one of the Vasculitis Foundation patients who sent in this great information. This patient was diagnosed with microscopic polyangiitis and she shows features of those ANCA-associated vasculitis. Spiky star-shaped things, larger areas with necrosis, and we can see these ring shapes or these lividoid shapes on the skin. When we see vasculitis, it's a little bit bigger and spiky and ring shapes. We're usually thinking of a systemic vasculitis like ANCA, something a little bit deeper. These are some other patients that had ANC associated vasculitis and other findings. This is sweets. This is that granulomatous disease. These are not things we would expect a patient to be able to identify themselves. We want the patient when they have a new skin finding to tell us about it and come on in. The next two photos are, or the next three photos are really pretty intense. So if you need to look away, go for it. The next is a very, very serious complication that happens. It's incredibly rare, incredibly rare. It's called pyoderma gangrenosum where the immune system attacks the skin itself and destroys it. In this patient, we see underlying muscle being exposed. But through medical treatment, we got this all the way better. It closed all the way. Another patient with ANCA-associated vasculitis had involvement of the surface of the eye. It's called nodular keratosis. And specifically with GPA, you can see these strawberry-like changes of the gums. So we can see lots of different types of skin findings of these patients. Here's a patient with eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, eGPA, who had a lot of hives as a result. Some patients get oral ulcers as well. So there's a lot of different findings that patients can have, especially with the ANCA-associated vasculitis. But the specific findings come from the fact that the involvement is a little bit deeper down. And again, it can take on that star shape or that net-like shape. All right. Let's go even deeper down the vasculitis tree. This patient doesn't have any blood colored spots, any petechia or purpura. Instead, this patient has very, very tender knots under her skin. When we run our fingers over this, it's kind of hard to photograph, but it feels like there's a tiny little marble underneath or a stone underneath the skin. And it's very painful to touch it even lightly. This 12 year old had uh, these findings. She had significant review of systems. So we're worried about a systemic vasculitis. We did a very special type of biopsy that showed that the deepest part of the vessels in the skin was inflamed down in that fatty tissue. All right, her urine analysis was normal. So instead of being up at the top, like our small vessel vasculitis, like our first patient, and instead of being somewhere in the middle, 
with all the branches, like our patient with GPA, patients with this condition, which is called polyarteritis nodosa, are all the way down here at the bottom of the trunk in the paniculus or the fatty tissue. So when the involvement starts, they get this swollen nodule that's underneath the surface of the skin without changes. If it progresses or becomes more severe, it can knock out that entire tree, leading to really large areas of damage or ulceration, sometimes even causing death of broad segments of skin across the fingers, the ears, etc. Now again, because it's knocking out portions of the tree, it looks kind of star-shaped or spiky from the surface. And these patients can also get lividoid or net-like changes. So this patient, we did a deep biopsy. We found she had polyarteritis nodosa. Uh, we did um, careful evaluation of the rest of her body. We used some special imaging to make sure that none of the larger blood vessels inside her body were impacted, and we found nothing. And this patient was diagnosed as cutaneous only polyarteritis nodosa. Medium vessel vasculitis, there are several, but for the skin, the most common that we see and treat is um, cutaneous or polyarteritis nodosa. There is a skin only variant. And there's been a lot of research into this disorder to see if there's a relationship between the two. Most experts agree that if the patient is appropriately worked up and diagnosed by people that have a lot of experience with it, the risk of progressing to PAN on the inside is extremely low. So on the inside, it can affect organs like the kidneys or the belly um, or the nerves. Um, it affects the kidneys differently than the smallest vessel vasculitis that we started with. Instead of blood and protein, because it affects the small vessels of the kidney, here PAN affects larger vessels. It's just like the skin. The small vessels in the kidneys do the filtering. So when they're damaged, things get through that aren't supposed to. The larger vessels in the kidney, it's their job to control our body's blood pressure in conjunction with other organs. When they're damaged, usually the first way they cry out is with a high blood pressure, really, really high. And we can see it on special imaging. So this patient didn't have it. So we treated her with special immunosuppressants and she did really, really well. Uh, this is that same patient. She also had an ulcer in her mouth. Ulcers in the mouth are really common in, in lots of different types of vasculitis, but a number of my PAN patients have had sores in their mouth, like this is another PAN patient. Um, PAN patients can have really big areas, so these are much bigger ulcers. They're very spiky and star-shaped. All right, uh, another kind of significant photograph here. Um, PAN can also knock out broader areas of involvement like we see there. Large vessel vasculitis is different. I only have a few photos here. These are really, really big arteries and it's very, very, very rare to have skin involvement with these. And when they do, it's just usually very, very, very large ulcers like this patient has on his scalp from temporal arteritis, which is also called giant cell arteritis. It can very rarely cause reduced blood flow of the tongue, making it look white and painful like this patient has or it can sometimes cause ulcers of the tongue. This next photo can be a little striking as well. Ulcers of the tongue as well. There's not many things that can cause large tongue ulcers like that, really, really, really large tongue ulcers. To finish up, there's also a small number of entities that look like vasculitis, but are not. This patient has spiky star-shaped things, but they turn kind of a normal color when I push on them. This is not blood outside of the vessels. This is purple from slow blood flow. Uh, this is called lividoid vasculopathy. It's the immune system causing clotting in blood instead of inflammation of blood vessels. Its characteristic finding are these bright white star-shaped scars called atrophy blanche. You can have some bigger findings, like some ulcers of the ankles, but it is not vasculitis. Even though sometimes it's mispronounced lividoid vasculitis, the actual name of this disease is lividoid vasculopathy, and it's a clotting problem. This is another condition that has petechia, but I hope you can see it's a different color than some of our other photos. It's kind of more of a golden brown or an orangey red. Uh, this is called capillaritis and is not vasculitis. This is from varicose veins most of the time. It's a harmless disorder that poses no threat to the patient's health. I put this photo here because patients with vasculitis like this one can get other normal things too. 
This looks a lot like that net-like finding I showed you previously, but the difference is it doesn't change color when I press on it. This is a skin change from overuse of a heating pad called erythema ab igni. Looks just like those lividoid changes. This is a scar, but it is harmless. There's no da damage done to the patient's health. It's just we have to tell them to use the heating pad less. Here's a patient as well uh, with vasculitis that got a, a rash on the arms after working in the yard. Uh, and like many patients with vasculitis, the important question to answer is, does this represent a flare of my vasculitis? This patient contacted, I believe, their nephrologist, who is kind of world famous, and he accurately pointed out that this was poison ivy. This is a patient with vasculitis that has plain old athlete's foot that was sent to me to see if it was a flare of vasculitis. So is a patient that has what's called superficial thrombophlebitis, which can look a lot like vasculitis, but this happened after the patient had surgery for varicose veins. So that's kind of my talk on the way that vasculitis can impact the skin. The summary is that when it's at the top, tiny little blood vessels, we see petechia. As it moves down the tree, as we might see in things like ANCA-associated vasculitis, um, the changes start to become those that are broader, more star-shaped or net-like, and can start to form ulcers. And when the involvement is all the way down at the biggest area, as we might see in a medium vessel vasculitis like PAN, we'll see large nodules underneath the skin, we'll see levito, or we'll see big areas of skin death or ulceration. Vasculitis can have a lot of skin findings. It can be really confusing. The goal of my talk is not to make patients the experts to be able to identify everything themselves, but it's to help understand what they're going through. If you have something on your skin and you're not sure what it is, that's when you ask your doctor. Your doctor is never going to be upset about that. It's our job to help the patient understand whether what they're dealing with is vasculitis, or maybe it could just be run-of-the-mill things that people without vasculitis get. Eczema, poison ivy, athlete's foot, sunburn, all of these things. So my, one of my most important takeaways is vasculitis can do a lot to the skin. But if you have something on your skin that's different and not going away, please talk to your doctor about it. I have a grant um, to help me study and do research. I'm very grateful for it. And part of the agreement is that I um, show this slide. So I am. Thank you. I look forward to questions.